Hey, hey, what is up, guys? It is Orbin Hardware, and in today's video, we're gonna try and build the ultimate 550 US dollar gaming PC for early 2021 with the parts right in front of you. Now, I'm gonna show you exactly how to put this complete PC build together from start to finish. Then, we're gonna start it up and test the gaming performance in some of the most popular games. And if you wanna build this computer too, all parts I've used are linked up down below. So spending about $550 will give you a PC build that is capable of running most games at 1080p high settings with smooth frame rate. And just a sneak peek at the performance shows that we're able to run all games tested with great results. But yeah, we're gonna dive into the gaming performance in much greater detail after we completed the build. Anyway, inside this machine we find an AMD Ryzen 3 3100, a GTX 970 graphics card, as well as a super fast M.2 drive, 16GB of RAM, and everything is going to house inside this cooler master case. Now before we get started, be sure to drop a comment, let me know what you thought about this video, drop a like if you enjoy this content, and make sure to subscribe to never miss an episode. So let's get started with the parts that are gonna be the base for today's build. This is the CPU, RAM and motherboard. And speaking of the motherboard, I picked up this Gigabyte branded board right now selling for $94, which makes it one of the cheapest B550 board around. It is called the DS3H and it has all the necessary features you would ask for. And this is one area in the PC building space where you can save a ton of money. Opting for a cheaper motherboard gives us more money over for a better graphics card and CPU. So let's take a look at the processor coming in at $99. This is the Ryzen 3 3100, which is a quad core CPU with 4 cores and 8 threads, with the base clock at 3.6 and a turbo of 3.9 GHz. Having a look at the CPU gaming performance, we see that the 3100 doesn't disappoint. Now, without going into the technical details behind it, this has much to do with the underlying architecture behind the third gen Ryzen CPUs. AMD simply made some significant improvements when they launched the Ryzen 3000, and as we can see, it is showing off in the benchmarks. Now, although the 3100 can't really compete with the more expensive picks, as we can see, it is still a fantastic CPU. CPU in a cheaper system with a graphics card priced around two to around three hundred dollars. So let's get the motherboard out, and as we can see, it comes with a retention frame pre-installed. But since we're gonna use a cooler with springs, we need to remove the retention frame from the motherboard. With the retention frame removed, we can now install our processor. And this is super easy. First thing you want to do is you want to open up the metal arm. Secondly, you want to locate what's looking like a golden triangle on the processor. And it happens to be that there is a exact triangle printed on the motherboard socket as well. And so what we want to do is you want to simply turn the CPU so that these triangles match up. Then you simply drop the processor into the socket and gently move the metal arm all the way down until it locks in place and voila, our CPU is installed. Inside the CPU box also comes a heatsink or a cooler and this cooler is actually not that bad if you aren't interested in doing heavy overclocking and I actually don't see any reasons not to use this as it's going to save us a couple of dollars. Now the cooler installment is pretty simple, it is the first time installing the CPU. The cooler already comes with some thermal grease pre-applied and you don't need to apply some thermal grease on the CPU lid as I'm doing right now. Position the CPU cooler so that the four spring screws on the heatsink align with the four screw holes on the backplate. Once aligned, carefully place the heatsink onto the CPU. Using a screwdriver, turn the spring screw half a turn clockwise to ensure that the spring screw makes a connection with the backplate. Follow a diagonal pattern across the CPU cooler like this, further tightening its spring screw with the full turn. And with all four spring screws connected to the backplate, tighten them until you feel resistance, then check the CPU cooler to double check that it's properly secured to the motherboard. Lastly, don't forget to connect the fan power cable to the CPU cooler to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. 
moving on to RAM, which uh, yeah, unfortunately has gone up a tiny bit over the last couple of weeks. Anyway, I'm gonna go with the Corsair Vengeance LPX because of its stellar quality and compatibility with the Ryzen platform. But there are a few other picks out there that I would highly recommend as well. And those are linked up down below. Now these sticks are rated at 3200 MHz, which uh, yeah, for time and time again has proven to be a sweet spot for the Ryzen platform, as this will give you a frame rate boost compared to you know a cheaper slow clock kit, and this is because of the way that the CPU and RAM communicate with each other. Now installing these bad boys is exactly as simple as it looks. You're gonna want to populate the gray slot, so simply pull back the toggle for the second and the fourth team slot and simply plug them in just like so. Now we have reached the point where it's time to install our M.2 drive and we find the M.2 slot right here. And so what you want to do is you want to loosen this tiny screw just like so. Then gently slide the M.2 unit into the socket with these little notches you can see on the opposite side of the CPU cooler just like so. Finally take the little screw again and hold it down just like that and screw it down until it stops. We can now go ahead and move our motherboard assembly if you like and install it in our case and for today's build I ended up picking the Cooler Master CM320L. I'm using the 320 for a couple of my PC builds now, which a lot of you guys seem to be enjoying. And I wanted to include it in one last PC build as I think it offers great value for its price. You're getting two 120 RGB fans, which opens up for great airflow over your CPU and graphics cards. Now these are A RGB driven, meaning that can be controlled and addressed by any motherboard. This however requires a digital RGB header, which yeah, fortunately our motherboard supports. Looking at the I.O. we find the power as well as a reset button. We also find two USB ports as well as a mic and audio port. And there's room to fit a 240 radiator at the top if you want to. A couple of things we need to do before installing our motherboard and the first thing we need to do is untie these four thumb screws in order to get access to the inside. Next Next we're going to install our IO shield that we find inside a motherboard box and this one goes in from the back of the case with these circular ports located at the bottom and also we want to remove these two PCIe brackets or slots as it can be hard to remove these once we have installed our motherboard. Now with the CPU cooler installed we can grab onto the CPU fan and slide the whole assembly into place. Thanks to one standoff in the middle being a little bit higher than the other ones allows the motherboard to lock into place and now we can easy and conveniently secure it having the case standing up and we're gonna use the screws that comes provided by Cooler Master. And with the board installed before we move on to power supply and graphics, now is a good time to connect the chassis cables that takes care of the front audio and USB as well as the power button. But let's start with USB 3 and this is what it looks like. And this connector is located down at the bottom of the motherboard. Moving on to front audio and this one goes to the left side corner. Lastly we have the front panel connectors and you find this on the lower right side. So let's go ahead and install our power supply and I chose this 550 watt unit from Corsair. This is a compact and silent and high quality PSU with 80 plus bronze efficiency certification with black sleeved cables coming in at just $58. For optimal cooling you want to make sure that you got the fan facing downwards then gently slide the PSU into place and secure it. And we're gonna do a couple of cables and wiring before installing our graphics. And first up we got the 24 pin power for our motherboard and this one goes to a connector uh, on the mid right side of the motherboard. Next up we got the 8 pin power for our CPU. This is also called the EPS and this one goes all the way up to the left top side corner. Time to install our graphics and for today's build we find a GTX 970, this one specifically from MSI equipped with their twin processor cooler. 
Now the 970 comes with 4 gigabytes of RAM, which uh, yeah is technically three and a half worth of VRAM, which we yeah later on discovered. Despite all of that, the 970 is still a very compelling 1080p graphics card if you can find one at the right price. Now usually before the lockdown and the mining boom, you could find the GTX 970 on eBay for about 100 to 110 dollars, and this is what I think the card is worth. However, right now the prices for GPUs in general have spiked way way higher because of high demand and low supply. But yeah, once the GPU manufacturers start meeting the demand again, we should also see prices falling and we hope that starts happening any day now. Anyway, as I mentioned, the 970 is perfectly good enough for 1080p, a high to medium settings and it performs right around the same as a GTX 1060 3GB variant. So take out the graphics card, plug it in and take this dual PCIe cable and plug it in to our graphics card just like so. And what is left to do is to flip the case around, whack on the side panel and we have officially completed our $500 gaming PC build. And if you followed every step along the way, your system should power on. So with that said, let's fire up some games and find out how it performs. And on your screen now, we're looking at the performance numbers that I've gathered from today's build and I ended up running 15 games and overall, I'm very happy with these results. Let's dive a bit deeper with some of the games tested and first, let's take a look at Death Stranding running at 1080p high settings. And as we can see, we're averaging around 68 FPS with 1% low at around 54 FPS. Moving on to CSGO and as we can see, I kind of went for a competitive frame rate here uh, where I left pretty much everything at low at 1080p and this results in around 170 to 180 FPS on average. Doom Eternal is next up and once again, I'm picking high settings and 1080p resolution which yeah results in about 78 fps and almost 60 fps at 1% low. Overwatch is next up and we're looking at 1080p high settings here. As we can see over 100 fps on average and about 112 fps at 1% low. Valorant runs with an average of 130 fps and looking at the settings we see that I left everything maxed out. Fortnite also runs great as we can see, with pretty much everything set at low, with viewing distance as well as textures maxed out. Call of Duty Warzone at 1080p runs at 72 FPS on average using the medium settings and yeah, Cyberpunk 2077. I was actually quite surprised that we were able to run this one. Everything here is at low at 1080p with 75% resolution scaling and so as we can see this results in a softer image but yeah given that we're averaging 57 FPS this is totally playable in my opinion. Again, all PC components can be found down below. Now, I am starting up a Discord server and uh, yeah, it would be fantastic if you guys wanted to join and start building this community. And here we're going to discuss PC builds and issues you might run into and everything in between. Now, you can ask me questions directly if you want to and I'm going to answer anything you guys might be asking. So you definitely want to join the Discord and you find the link to Discord down below. Now, Watch it of these two videos and I will see you guys in the next video.